They called it the weapon that should never have been built. When Honda unleashed a five-cylinder monster on the MotoGP grid in 2002, rivals didn't just lose races. They lost hope. This wasn't evolution. This was revolution wrapped in Repsol colors. A machine so dominant it rewrote the rulebook and forced the entire sport to change the regulations just to stop it. The RC211V didn't just win. It annihilated. In the heart of this beast, a V5 engine configuration no one saw coming. The secret weapon born from a forgotten prototype. The story of Honda's RC211V begins not in 2002, but 14 years earlier in a shadowy development facility where engineers were building something the world would never see. Project leader Tomu Shiozaki had a secret advantage hidden in Honda's vault, a V6 prototype from 1988 called the FXX. This wasn't some abandoned experiment gathering dust in a forgotten corner. This was a study project with laser focus on compactness and mass centralization, and when test riders threw their legs over it, they couldn't believe what they were feeling. The FXX delivered significantly higher performance, and, according to those who dared to ride it, handled better than the legendary 750cc RC30 V4 they were comparing it with. Better than the RC30. Think about that for a moment. But Honda buried it. The RC30 was dominating world superbike, endurance racing, and Formula TT. Market demand for racing replicas was through the roof, and the RC30 covered that perfectly. There was no business case for the FXX, so the project came to an untimely end. The prototype was mothballed. The engineers moved on. The FXX died in silence. Except it didn't really die. Shiozaki never forgot. He stored that knowledge, that geometry, that revolutionary thinking about mass centralization in the back of his mind, waiting for the right moment. And when MotoGP announced it was transitioning from 500cc two-strokes to 990cc four-stroke prototypes for 2002, the moment arrived. The dominance of 500cc two-stroke machines in Grand Prix racing came to an end in 2001, and the following year, 990cc four-stroke prototypes were allowed to join the grid, heralding in the new MotoGP era. Here's where Honda made a decision that changed everything. While Yamaha, Suzuki, and Aprilia were essentially taking their existing 500cc GP chassis and swapping out two-stroke engines for four-stroke power plants, Honda took a different path. Shiozaki pulled the FXX blueprint from the shadows and convinced Honda to create a completely new road racer instead of following on from the NSR 500. This wasn't evolution. This was starting from zero with 14 years of hidden knowledge, giving them a head start. While competitors were modifying, Honda was revolutionizing. While others adapted, Honda innovated. The RC211V wasn't just a motorcycle. It was a ghost brought back from the dead to hunt down every two-stroke that had dominated the previous generation. Why five cylinders? When everyone else chose four. Here's where Honda's engineers made the decision that would define a generation of motorcycle racing. When Shiozaki sat down to design the RC211V, the most critical choice wasn't about horsepower or top speed. It was about the number of cylinders firing beneath the fuel tank. And unlike most engineering decisions that involve painful compromises, the regulations handed him a gift wrapped in technical complexity. Four-cylinder and five-cylinder MotoGP racers were set at exactly the same minimum weight, 145 kilograms. Read that again. Same weight limit for four or five cylinders. This was the regulatory loophole that would change motorcycle racing forever. A six-cylinder engine would have added another 10 kilograms that Honda didn't want. That extra weight would kill the mass centralization philosophy carried over from the FXX project. The engine would sit higher, the center of gravity would rise, and everything Shiozaki learned from that 1988 prototype would be wasted. A triple didn't appeal despite the fact it could be lighter, but five cylinders could deliver more power than three or four. That was the reason for Honda's final choice, and it was brilliant in its cold mathematical simplicity. More cylinders meant more power strokes per crankshaft revolution, more opportunities for combustion, more torque, all without paying a weight penalty that would cripple handling. But there was something deeper happening here, something that went beyond simple cylinder count mathematics. The V5 configuration offered what Shiozaki called a functional habitat that suited a motorcycle perfectly. This wasn't just about stuffing five pistons into a crankcase and hoping for the best. In addition, 
A V5 had this immediate space around the engine block where additional functions could be placed, things like an alternative airbox design that could feed those five hungry cylinders with precisely metered air. Heat could dissipate through carefully designed cooling passages. Cool air could circulate efficiently within the compact V5 layout, enhancing thermal balance and preventing excessive heat buildup during operation. And here's where it gets wild. The V5 engine design created so many options for placing the engine in the frame that multiple angles were possible. Theoretically, it could even be mounted upside down without changing the riding characteristics much. Think about that. An engine so well balanced, so perfectly designed, that you could flip it completely over and the bike would still handle predictably. This gave Honda design freedom that four-cylinder competitors couldn't even dream about. While Yamaha engineers were locked into specific engine positions dictated by the inline four layout, Honda could adjust rake, trail, swing arm pivot position, and chassis geometry almost independently of engine placement. The geometry of dominance. Three forward, two back. The V5 layout became Honda's calling card, their signature, the silhouette that struck fear into every other garage on the MotoGP grid. Three cylinders faced forward, two faced back, arranged in a 75.5 degree V angle that seemed pulled from an engineer's fever dream. But that seemingly arbitrary number, it was anything but random. That 75.5 degree V angle provided spot-on primary balance, eliminating the need for power-sapping balancer shafts that would have stolen horsepower and added parasitic weight and complexity. While competitors were managing vibration with counterbalancing systems that robbed power to spin extra counterweights, the RC211V's engine was inherently smooth, a self-balancing mechanical symphony that didn't waste a single horsepower on anything except making the rear tire spin faster. Honda didn't start from scratch with the internal architecture, even though they were building a completely new motorcycle. The RC211V was technically related to Honda's RC45 World SBK racer, sharing the same 72 by 46 millimeter bore and stroke and using a similarly shaped combustion chamber. They borrowed proven combustion chamber geometry that had won races around the world, but the real magic the innovation that made riders fall in love with the ERC211V came from NSR 500 DNA spliced into four-stroke architecture. The Big Bang Firing Order technology came directly from Honda's successful NSR 500 V4 two-stroke racer, the machine that had terrorized Grand Prix racing through the 90s, with Mick Doohan dominating on it year after year. This wasn't just a four-stroke mindlessly copying a two-stroke blueprint. This was Honda understanding at a fundamental level that the Big Bang firing order allowed riders to make much better use of engine power and take full advantage of the increased torque that four-stroke engines naturally produced compared to two-strokes, instead of firing at even intervals, which creates smooth power but less traction control for the rider. The Big Bang configuration fired multiple cylinders close together, then had a longer gap before the next firing event. This created a pulsing power delivery that helped rear tires grip in corners. The tire would hook up during the firing pulse, then relax during the gap, preventing the constant slip that smooth firing engines created. Riders could feel when the tire was about to break loose and modulate the throttle accordingly. It was the difference between trying to catch a falling knife and knowing exactly when the knife would fall. The result? An engine that was shorter than a V4, narrower, and much more compact than an inline four-cylinder, with power delivery characteristics that made it rideable at the absolute limit of tire adhesion. It featured double overhead camshafts and four valves per cylinder, like its competitors. But the V5 packaging meant it could fit into a chassis with dimensions that shouldn't have been possible for an engine, making over 220 horsepower. Engineering sorcery, semi-dry sump, and fuel injection wizardry. Shiozaki made choices that sound boring until you understand what they unlocked. He opted for a semi-dry sump system, and while that might seem like typical engineering detail, it was actually a masterclass in extracting performance from thermodynamics. The semi-dry sump reduced pumping losses and prevented blow-by, those combustion gases that sneak past piston rings into the crankcase, stealing power and building pressure. With this system, blow-by happened less. The crankcase stayed more compact which made it stronger. A stronger crankcase meant higher power output and better durability. 
and there was no need for a separate oil tank, saving weight and complexity. But the fuel injection system? That's where Honda's engineers went into another dimension entirely. They placed two multiple-hole atomizing injectors in the inlet tract for each cylinder, two per cylinder. One injector sat above the throttle valve and operated at full throttle. The other sat below the throttle valve, designed specifically for better performance in the low and mid-rev ranges. But Honda didn't stop there. The fuel pressure was variable, continuously controlled by the ECU in real time based on throttle position, engine speed, and atmospheric conditions. Based on this continuous ECU control, Honda designed the inlet tract and positioned the injectors so that when opening or closing the throttle, a certain amount of fuel actually remained in the intake ports between each engine cycle, clinging to the inner surfaces until the inlet valves opened for the next cycle. This optimized throttle response for the rider and had a positive effect on the engine's power output. Competitors didn't even know this was possible. The engine management system needed to handle this complexity was the first of a new generation. It could be programmed easily, which became a bigger advantage than expected when teams traveled from track to track, dealing with wildly different atmospheric conditions. In the end, they managed a maximum power output of just over 220 horsepower at 14,000 RPM, with an estimated engine life of only 120 kilometers. The power delivery was very smooth, and from lower revs straight up to higher revs, the huge amount of torque remained intact throughout the power band. The chassis that made champions, unit ProLink, and mass centralization. The RC211V used a slipper clutch in combination with a six-speed gearbox operated by a quick shifter, technology that would become standard but was cutting edge in 2002. The chassis built on NSR500 DNA but wasn't simply an evolution. The RC211V's 1,440mm wheelbase was 40mm longer than the NSR500, improving stability without sacrificing agility. The aluminum twin spar frame wasn't just determined by the engine. It was designed in conjunction with the fuel tank location. Mass centralization wasn't a suggestion. It was religion. The fuel tank was placed one-third under the rider's seat, as close as possible to the motorcycle's center of gravity. This meant an increasingly emptying fuel tank didn't disturb handling as the laps counted down. Every other manufacturer watched fuel load change chassis behavior lap by lap. Honda made that problem disappear. Shiozaki designed the chassis with emphasis on longitudinal stiffness, but with a twist. It was specifically done to make the chassis slightly more flexible at higher lean angles, which enhanced control during sliding. When tires started to let go, the RC211V stayed manageable. And then there was the new Unit Pro Link rear suspension. Honda eliminated the damper mount on the upper cross member and placed the rear shock in a much more vertical position compared to the NSR500. Better packaging, better performance, better control. Evolution of a killer, 220. Horsepower became 253. The 2002 RC211V stunned the paddock with just over 220 horsepower at 14,000 RPM, with an engine life of only 120 kilometers before needing a complete rebuild. Valentino Rossi won the rider's title in the first year, dominating races with a combination of his supernatural talent and a machine that responded to his every input. Then, he did it again in 2003. The RC211V had initially dominated MotoGP, claiming the rider's title in the hands of Valentino Rossi in its first two attempts. But Honda wasn't satisfied. For 2004, the EGRC211V engine was thoroughly reworked in a bid to reduce reciprocating weight. Lighter pistons, lighter connecting rods, every gram examined and reduced. A new 5 into 4 exhaust system improved torque while increasing peak power to 241.5 horsepower at 16,000 RPM. Honda's intelligent throttle control system, ITCS, appeared, giving riders electronic assistance in managing the explosive power. The frame and swing arm underwent numerous changes as Honda experimented with geometry. Alex Barros clocked the highest ERC 211 V speed of the 2004 season, 343 km per hour at the Italian Grand Prix at Mugello. When Valentino Rossi defected to Yamaha and won in 2004 and 2005, Honda responded with fury. For 2005, Honda opted to redesign both engine and chassis. New bore and stroke values of 76 by 43.6 mm saw power increase to 253 horsepower at 16,000 RPM.
The ITCS system was developed to have the two rear cylinders controlled by ride-by-wire, while the front three maintained cable control, giving precise electronic control where it mattered most for traction. By 2006, the RC211V had reached its ultimate evolution. Minor geometry changes and electronics refinements enhanced traction, engine braking, cornering, and acceleration. With the new generation RC211V, Nicky Hayden won both the Dutch and American MotoGP races and finally wrestled the rider's world title off Valentino Rossi for the first time since the Italian joined the premier class. Casey Stoner reached a speed of 334 km per hour on his LCRRC 211V during the 2006 Italian Grand Prix at Mugello, proving that even in privateer hands, the RC 211V remained one of the fastest motorcycles ever built. The numbers that forced MotoGP to change the rules. Let's talk about dominance in the language of cold, hard mathematics. In five years of racing from 2002 to 2006, the RC211V won 48 victories in 82 races. That's a 58.5% winning average across five seasons against the best riders and machines the world could build. This was the most impressive record in Honda's 50 years of Grand Prix racing history. And it wasn't even close. The RC211V didn't just beat competitors. It made them mathematically irrelevant. The RC211V initially dominated MGPT, not through small advantages, but through overwhelming superiority. Valentino Rossi proved that a great rider on the RC211V was untouchable, winning back-to-back -back championships before defecting to Yamaha. But even after Rossi left, even after Yamaha and Ducati developed their own competitive machines, the RC211V was still winning races and championships. Ten different riders won Grands Prix on the RC211 fly. It wasn't a bike that only worked for one riding style. It was a weapon that made everyone who swung a leg over it faster. The machine was so successful that MotoGP organizers decided the 990 cubic centimeters formula was creating bikes that were too fast, too powerful, too dangerous. Top speeds were approaching 350 kilometers per hour. Crashes were getting more violent. So they changed the rules. For 2007, maximum engine displacement was reduced to 800 cubic centimeters. The RC211V era ended, not because Honda couldn't develop it further, but because the sanctioning body said enough. When your machine is so good, that an entire racing series rewrites the rulebook to slow you down, you've built something that transcends mere success. Honda created a completely new road racer for MotoGP instead of following on from the NSR 500, and that decision to start fresh paid dividends that still echo through motorcycle racing today. The V5 configuration offered superior characteristics for a motorcycle with maximum power and minimum weight, wrapped in a philosophy of mass centralization that made the bike handle like it was reading the rider's mind. The RC211V wasn't just a motorcycle. It was proof that when engineers chase perfection without compromise, when they resurrect forgotten prototypes and dare to think in five cylinders instead of four, the result rewrites history. The V5 engine remains one of the most exotic configurations ever to win a world championship. It's a monument to what happens when brilliance, bravery, and a complete disregard for conventional thinking collide on two wheels at 200 miles per hour.